Thank you, Alice, for that. And um, thank you to you and the Dance UK team for inviting me to come along tonight. Also, thanks to all the people who donated, um, provided some information that I'm going to be sharing with you today. They've been very generous with uh, sharing with me some of their information about their digital marketing so I can give you some insights into what some organisations are doing. Um, if you're here and I do one of your case studies, just go, Whoo! or yell out to me in some way if I haven't seen you already. Um, and welcome to all of you for actually coming along in the pouring rain um, to actually um, be a part of this today. Thank you. We're actually going to kick off straight away into a video. I love that video. I've been showing that for about three years now and it makes me laugh every time. Who's already seen it? Well, I'm glad some of you hadn't, so that's brilliant. Did you see anything new this time? Yeah, yeah, there's always something new happening in the, in the back there. I've shown you that for a couple of reasons. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about the power of video in digital marketing and Andre will cover um, the power of video, I'm sure, in his uh, presentation. The main reason I wanted to show that to you is to remind you of how lucky you are to be marketing dance or to be working in the dance space. Your product and what you're working with is what all the large companies and everybody else uses to actually market, it, market their products. So how fortunate are you to actually be working in that space? All right, so today as part of the um, Business of Dance series, we're going to be talking about digital marketing. I um, am Natasha Reynolds. I run a company called Danceology based in the Sussex Innovation Centre. I founded Danceology in 2011 after moving here from Australia. And I've worked in the digital space for about 10 years now. So during that time, I've had the opportunity to work with large companies, FTSE 100 companies and small companies, and to focus my time on some arts and culture organisations, which is an aspect I really, really enjoy. And Danceology was really an evolution from the tech, tech company I owned in Australia to focus a little bit more in the dance space so I could spend my time in the area that I really love. So today we're going to look at these uh, six key areas. We're going to have a look at um, digital marketing, what is it and why would you spend your time and energy working in it. We're going to have a look at a, um, a foundation that I <coughs> use with my clients when I'm working with them that I call the six steps to dance marketing and that will form the framework of my talk and then within that we'll cover some marketing fundamentals, have a look at some real world examples and if we've got time, we'll look at some future technology that's evolving that you might find interesting. Hi, welcome. And then we'll have a Q&A session. <coughs> so um, today we actually have a really diverse audience here today. We've got people from students through to interns through to really senior are marketers in marketing positions in large organisations. So it's a little bit tricky for me to actually deliver uh, a talk to you that um, will really hit the spot for you. So what I'd like to ask you to do is just um, sit back, relax, listen to what I have to say and try and focus on your own personal situation and tease out of my talks things, my talk, things that will be relevant to you and your situation. Um, can I see a show of hands? Uh, would you, who in the audience would consider themselves a professional marketer? Yep, okay. And who in the audience would consider themselves a novice when it comes to digital marketing? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, let's see how, how we go with this. I, these slides will be available on the Dance UK TV site for you to um, access and download so you'll be able to go back and have a look. At the end of the slide deck there's a really long list of links so anything I talk about will be linked to from there so you'll be able to follow up later. Um, so hopefully that will be useful for you. There's a couple of three key themes that I tend to talk with um, clients about when I'm talking about digital marketing and they are these areas. 
be playful, be useful, and be mobile. When I say mobile, what I'm actually talking about is being mobile friendly, so making sure everything you do in your digital marketing, people can access it on their phones and on their tablets. So let's have a look at what is digital marketing. This map, I quite, this digital marketing map from Hallam, I quite like because you probably can't see it way up the back, but I'll talk you through it a little bit. It shows the complexity of the digital marketing landscape. Hi. So we have a lot of areas here in digital marketing. This is your website, which is often the core and the hub of where your digital marketing is happening. Then we have all sorts of other areas such as email marketing, paid search, SEO, search en engine optimization, social media, the green section is all the social media spaces. So we'll talk a lot tonight about social media engagement and when people talk about digital marketing they often um, then focus on social, social media just because it's such a powerful and accessible um, aspect of digital marketing, but there is more to it. There's this entire landscape of other areas. When I'm planning digital marketing campaigns, I sort of uh, initially do up a very quick table of the campaigns I've got listed one to six down the side and then I'll list the different channels I could use in my digital marketing and then I'll work out whether they're going to be high priority or low priority in those areas. So I sort of tend to map things out a bit when I'm first thinking through concepts. I just show this to you um, today to just highlight that idea of there is, there is a bit of detail and strategy involved in um, digital marketing. So if it is complex and if it does take a bit of time and effort, why, why would you actually bother to invest your time? Particularly if you're not a full-time professional marketer for a large organisation and you're an independent artist wearing several different hats, why would you actually spend time in this space? Well, the first reason, and I think one of the most important reasons, is that what you do matters. So we talked about the power of dance with that video earlier. I just want to remind you that the things that you're doing, whether you're doing it personally, if you're a, a dance maker yourself and marketing what you do, or if you're working in the marketing department of a venue, um, dance changes people's lives. So I'm sure all of you have seen a quote like this over time about the, the influence that um, the impact you've made on your audiences. So dancing makes life better. It doesn't matter if you're working in health and wellbeing space, whether you're sharing some sort of insight, be it political, social or personal, or it's a purely entertainment night, entertaining night out, you're actually making life better. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about our jobs is that we actually get to spend time making people's lives better. The second reason you should spend your time with digital marketing is because that's where your audience is now. If you have a look at this infographic, it illustrates how the internet population has doubled in the five years from 2007 to 2012 and that's accelerating over the last couple of years as well. If we have a look at the UK specifically, we can see that out of the 63 million people in the country, 87% of those are actually internet users at the moment. 57% are Facebook users. And very interestingly, 130% are mobile users. So what this is actually indicating is that people have more than one mo mobile device. So there's more mobile accounts than actual people. On that matter, does anybody know what this photo is from 2005? No? It's actually a... Um, shot uh, in Rome of St. Peter's Square uh, leading up to the, the Basilica where um, when uh, Pope John Paul II had passed away and they were transporting his body through the square to the Basilica. 
This is the same location in 2013, and you'll note the difference. <laughs> um, this is uh, Pope Francis's inaugural speech in St. Peter's Square, and we can see what's happened in that time. Globally, more people now own a mobile than a toothbrush. <laughs> I'm harping on this topic because it's really important for you and for your organisations that people can actually buy tickets or access your information mobile because that's what people want to do now. So you need to be in the space where your audiences are. We know that 51% of people are actually ready to buy from their mobiles, but less than 5% of businesses are ready to make that happen for them. So if you can make your website and your ticketing system mobile friendly, you're a step ahead. Let's look at some other statistics that um, point towards why you should be spending time in the digital space. We know that 90% of people trust peer recommendations and if you get a Facebook like or some really nice comment on Twitter, that's the modern digital peer recommendation. 93% of people are influenced by social media. And getting back to the beauty of your content, you've got the perfect content to actually engage in the digital space. You've got rich media, beautiful photos, lovely videos, and great content to work with. So there's no excuse to not really be pushing this medium. Let's focus a little bit on this concept of being playful. Excellent. Um, on the way here today, I was in um, uh, the tube station and the stairs going down had the, you know, the piano keys on there and I felt like doing a bit of a dance, but it didn't quite work the same way. Um, that fu fun theory video uh, addresses this notion of play and how important it can be in the topic of um, what we call behaviour change. I spend a lot of my time now actually working um, with this notion of behaviour change and how to get people to um, take actions that they wouldn't have done without some sort of incentive or some, some disruptive thing that would make them uh, choose to do that. Uh, it's really interesting and important aspect of digital marketing because if you can grab someone's attention and inspire them and excite them, then they'll go on a journey that they might not have gone before. So um, let's just have a look at a real world example where um, th this theory was used to a degree to um, get a result for a dance organisation. So we'll have a look at um, the place and uh, their three-week season with protein and border tails. Um, that was led by Caroline Schreiber and her team at the place. Is Caroline here today? Hello. Thank you for sharing. Caroline, really appreciate it. So um, this three-week season earlier on in the year, it was really important for the place because the length of the season was unusual. So three weeks to actually um, fill, fill the... Um, the seats over that period. So what Caroline decided to do was tease out one of the key themes within the, um, the performance, which was this notion of I think, you think. <coughs> and that was rolled out across an integrated marketing campaign, which wasn't just digital, it was offline and online. Um, but it was a powerful, it's, it's a provocative um, notion. Um, may not at first seem playful, but it is because of the way people interacted. The, the, um, if you actually saw Border Tales, it, it deals with things in a sort of a playful way, addressing important, serious issues. So um, this was taken across the digital marketing campaign as well, to specifically to the theatre segment that was being targeted for this campaign. So the digital act, uh, activity involved things such as online advertising with um, mid-page units and, and takeovers of sites and some social media engagement, e-newsletters and some video content that was produced in the lead up to the show. And we have some amazing results that came out of that campaign. Over the three weeks there was a 91% capacity 
for that show. Also, um, I really like this statistic, there were 45% new attendees. The team's goal originally was 30%, so they exceeded their goal in that area. Lessons learnt. Um, I think this is one worth sharing with you that um, Caroline told me was that with their videos, if it was a video that linked to YouTube, she got a much higher click-through rate if it looked like a YouTube video. So when you send out your e-newsletter or on your website, if it looks like an embed to a YouTube video, people click on it because they're used to that space and they know how to work it. If it's just a straight image or a link to a video, they don't engage with it as much. So her team spent time, because their technology wouldn't allow them to do that naturally, organically, spent time actually making things look like YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding that, measuring the results and then understanding that and making a little bit of a difference to the way you work gets a really, um, makes a really big impact. Also, um, the, this I think, you think concept was rolled out to the theatre target um, market but not to the dance segment. And on reflection, they felt that they should have been more confident with this playful notion and rolled it out to both because it made for a more exciting campaign. All right, so what we're going to do now is start to move into this um, foundation of the six steps to dance marketing that I tend to work with. We start up here with um, who are you and understanding yourself and your organisation. Then we look at the audience and who they are and how you can connect with them. And then we're going to have a look at actually doing it, the actions and the tactics and the measurements. Um, I'll we'll walk through those quite slowly and have a lot of examples and um, discussion moving through that. So let's have a look. Who are you? Um, if you work for a large organisation, it's probably quite clear to you what your brand is and what your organisation stands for and it's easy to understand what the core values are of the organisation and how you want audiences to perceive you. If you're a um, emerging company or an emerging artist and a dance maker that's um, practice is growing and developing, it's a little bit harder to um, get your head around the concept of a brand. Um, what's really important is just to understand what your core values are really and think about why, uh, why you got into this business and why you're actually working in that space and just make sure that those core values and that theme runs a thread through all your marketing and through your engagement so you can develop an authentic voice to actually speak in your digital marketing area. If you have a unique selling position, a USP, it's really useful and handy to utilise. Um, Vincent Dance Theatre have a foundation in feminist thinking and therefore they have a USP that's useful for them in particular situations. If you can think about your organisation, if your first, biggest, best niche in a particular area, have some sort of passion that you can focus on that's of interest to your audience and they want to know that and you should be communicating that to them. Another key point to understand with digital marketing and particularly social media marketing is that small is good. You don't have to be worried if you're new or small or you don't have a lot of resources because the large companies like Nike are trying to sound like you. They're trying to sound, sound like startups. They're trying to sound like small uh, organisations with authentic voices. So think of that as an advantage, not a disadvantage. <coughs> Let's have a look at step two now. Who is your audience? So is there anyone here that's working with the audience agency presently to understand their audiences? Yep, yep, okay. Um, the audience agency provides resources and assistance and help, some of it free, some of it paid, to help you understand and engage with your audiences. 
just on last Thursday, they released their new audience spectrum tool and it segments audiences into 10 different areas that help you understand who might connect um, with you and where your audiences might be. I've, in the past, I've used their 13 um, segments, their audience insights section to develop strategies and decide where to invest time and energy. This new one I haven't had a chance to look at yet because it's, um, it's launched on Thursday and they haven't actually published the dance specific results for it yet, but I'm on their back now, so um, hopefully that will happen soon. Uh, it's worth a look if you're not familiar with what they do. One of the key points to understanding your audience is understanding why, they're actually, why they buy, why they're motivated to come to your events. So um, marketers will sort of break down products into three areas. There's the actual product, the augmented product, and the core product. So for example, the actual product is they're uh, purchasing a ticket to attend one of your events, let's say. The augmented product, product is maybe a program, maybe some exclusive content that you can provide them and that's adding value to the actual product and that exclusive content is an area you can really tease out um, with digital marketing and digital technologies as well. Um, the core product is the really key thing. The core product is why people are parting with their money and their time to actually spend time with you. So what you need to understand is why they're doing that. Is it because they want a great night out with friends? Is it because they're following the work of a particular choreographer and they want to see what they've done next? Work out what it is that they're, that's motivating them to buy a ticket and attend your events and then make sure your digital marketing messages are regularly focusing on these key drivers. Design your content and think about things considering those, that core product. Step three, where is your audience? This is a long step we're going to work through now. So, if we look at the statistics from to, uh, January this year, this is social media use for the general public or for all those internet users that we spoke about earlier. So, 87% are on any social network, Nearly 80% are on Facebook, who's been the leader since they started. Twitter, 44. Google Plus, 33. LinkedIn, 22. Instagram, 13. So that's what the general public, where the general public is spending their time. The green is they have an account. The yellow is when they last engaged in the last month what percentage last was on there in the last month. If we actually drill down a little bit further and have a look at arts and culture uh, segment and what's going on with the organisations, this is a, is a chart from the Arts Council's survey into their national portfolio organisations and how they're engaging in the digital space. And it, is quite similar, it reflects a lot the actual uh, general public's habits. So these um, uh, arts and culture organisations are primarily spending their time in Facebook, then Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Vimeo, and it goes down here. Google Plus is quite, quite low. If we have a look at how things have grown since 2004 when Facebook began, you can see they've been the leaders and still are at the moment. But some really interesting things to note is that Twitter has started to plateau a little bit, as has Pinterest, but Instagram has got an extra surge of power, which you probably all will have noticed from your audiences and um, campaigns you might be running yourself. Instagram surged. And look what's happening with Google+. Plus. It's going crazy. So I think um, there's a lot of potential and growth there in the Google+, Plus space. At the moment, a lot of arts organisations aren't really in that space and there's not much engagement going on. Um, but I think it would be worth your while to actually get, get a profile in there and actually start to 
um, work that over time because we could see some real, real growth over the next 12 months. Just on the topic of Instagram, this is Olivia Ashton. Does anyone know Olivia? She's a young dance student and she decided two years ago that she would take a photo of herself every day and upload it to Instagram and occasionally add a quote, an inspirational quote. And when I was speaking with Olivia, I said, what, why did you do it? And she said, I did it for my own motivation because I used to get really down a lot about what I was doing and I was trying to keep myself inspired. So if I set myself this goal to do an image every day, I had to get it together and I had to make things happen. And then I'd do a quote that would sort of inspire me to keep going. Now this really simple idea and dedication to doing something regularly um, went quite crazy and she became Instagram famous. She's got 23,000 uh, 23, followers on Instagram and 20,000 on Twitter. Now this is just a student developing her own practice and doing what she finds fun. But imagine if Olivia now puts on an event the actual reach she has to connect with audiences and fans, loyal fans. There's an incredible amount of engagement that's going on between Olivia and the people that follow her on Instagram. Number four, how can you connect with your audience? Just before we move to that, can I just get a show of hands of who's actually involved in Instagram from your business, from your dance practice perspective? Yep, okay. It's be, a lot of competitions are being run on there now. It's, um, it's gaining some momentum because it's such a visual. Instagram was mobile first, so it was built as a mobile platform and works really well in that mobile space, whereas Pinterest was built as a desktop solution. So um, it's probably one of the reasons that um, Instagram is gaining ground. So we're just going to have a look now at um, how you can connect with your audience. I'd like to talk about this second theme of um, being useful. Over the last 10 years, this sounds really, really simple, but over the last 10 years, this one thing has emerged as probably one of the most important things with your digital marketing, provide useful content, be useful to your audience because they're busy people. They, they want to have fun and they want to play or they want to know something useful. They don't want to waste their time. So let's have a think about that for a little bit. Um, this is a Google Plus a post from a company called Vivify. They work in, um, they do websites and mobile apps for their target is the health industry and their clients are quite, their key clients are quite hard to get to because you can't really sell to them in the traditional sense. They're health commissioners in local councils and things. So what Vivify does is create an e-newsletter with the entire goal of that newsletter is containing useful content that the people that receive it will actually keep and look back on later or learn something from. We're going to have a little look at some marketing theory now. Um, who here in the audience is familiar with the seven P's of marketing? Don't be shy. Come on, I know more of you do than you're admitting. Yep, okay. So this is a bit of a um, traditional view on marketing, but I really like it when it comes to dance marketing because it covers a lot of aspects that nowadays we can forget about when we're busy in the social media space. So um, with the seven Ps, we have your product, which we've talked about already, particularly your core product. Pricing, which you can use different strategies to encourage more ticket sales. You need to be careful with the pricing um, if you sell more tickets than you expect at a group or a discounted rate. You've got a little bit of a budget challenge, so you have to be uh, careful with that one. Place where your event is being held, um, to consider how people feel when they're in that space, when they come into a space, make the, the place um, comfortable for them and, and adding to the experience. Promotion is the area where um, social media marketing and digital marketing traditionally come in. 
in relation to people, it's really important if you run an Instagram competition or do something in the social media space, you let your people know. If you've got a dance company, let all the dancers know that you're having a competition. Make sure communication goes across the whole organisation because then there's extra powerful word of mouth and if people are asking questions, people can respond. So that's something that often gets forgotten. The communication breaks down internally and the public know about something but people within an organisation don't. It's worth considering. Our physical is just the physical attributes of something, so maybe what a ticket looks like, um, that type of thing, what your website looks like, how things physically look. And process is the processes you use, uh, the journeys people go on to buy a ticket and come to a, an event, the processes you have in place to actually make things happen. I'll talk about process a little bit more later because that tends to get forgotten. If you want to know more about the seven Ps and some marketing theory to really help bolster um, what you're doing, the Arts Marketing Association is really, really helpful. They specifically focus on arts marketing rather than business marketing. They run a website called Culture Hive, which have a lot of really useful um, resources you can access for free. And the Chartered Institute of Marketing can be really helpful as well. They have lots of templates and things online. So just getting back to that P of process, um, what I find is really useful is, is sometimes, particularly if you're wearing lots of different hats and you don't have time to actually do the digital marketing and you want to and you know you should but you don't actually do it because you don't have the time to do it, if you can create something that works as a trigger for you which will flow on to other things then you can develop a process that will make you create some content. So for example, with Vivify's e-newsletter, once a month they have to create a newsletter. That's a commitment that they've made internally, the, um, their audience expects it, it's going to happen. Now that e-newsletter means that they've had to create content for the e-newsletter to click to, so maybe some blog articles on the website. That then in turn turns into social media posts that can happen over the next month. They can blog one article one week, another one another week. They can come back in six months' time if it's still relevant and refer back to that blog article. But the really key point to understand is that they've set themselves this trigger. They've put something in place to make this content happen. It's, if, it's a useful thing to think about. So let's have a look at a real world example. Um, we're going to have a look at New Movement Collective. Is Jonathan or anybody from New Movement Collective here? No? Okay, well uh, they've shared some information with us as well which is really useful. So last year they undertook, um, they did a pro project in a Grade 2 listed building and uh, there were 14 performances. It was called Nest in a, in a lovely old chapel. And it was a very important thing for them, um, apart from the artistic practice and the artistic side, it was their first big marketing endeav endeavour. So um, New Movement Collective, a collective of dance makers working together, all wearing lots of hats, all very busy with other projects as well. And Jonathan Goddard took the lead on how to actually roll out a bit of a marketing campaign to uh, promote this event. Jonathan um, actually was very, very clever and decided to really have a think about the process and how he was going to work through this and make this happen um, and brought on board Stephen Drew, who's a very experienced marketer, to sort of mentor him and help him along the way. So their team then uh, undertook some activities they hadn't really done before in order to market this event. So it involved social media, e-news, um, th they used MailChimp quite effectively. A lot of my clients use MailChimp free e-newsletter system. Uh, they used videos which they rolled out to promote the event in the lead up. And one really important point is that Jonathan did the Dance UK mentoring scheme. And he said one of the key things with the success of their event was that that indirectly linked him to someone at BBC News, which turned into a news um, uh, event. 
So they got a lot of exposure that they wouldn't have got otherwise through doing the mentoring program. They were uh, very thorough at actually keeping an eye on what happened. So you know, on this graph, what's happened here is these are ticket sales over time and things that have happened. So this is when they released the first trailer. They could see a blip in their um, ticket sales and they watched what happened so that they could learn from that and apply that next time. So let's have a look at some of their results. Um, 76 capacity for the two-week event in the uh, church, five and a half thousand additional reach on their Facebook connections, and most importantly, a lot of learning and a lot of new contacts were made during this process. So they've sort of documented and know how next time to do a marketing um, campaign, how they would approach it. They also were invited to work on new collaborations based on the exposure they got from their digital marketing. Some lessons learnt along the way. Um, they found that it was really, really important to have quality content. So good images, good videos, um, rich media content would equal lots of sharing. So the more exciting the images and the higher quality the image, the more sharing they get. On reflection, they hoped, um, they thought that they should have done some more tailored marketing packages for their collaborators. So there's a lot of people collaborating on this project and a lot of networks they could have harnessed more if they could have handed them something easy to share with others. And I think that's a key point because often when we're marketing or, or sharing a message about something, we're busy and we're sharing it, if you step back and take a moment to think, how easy is it for this other person to share it if you want them to use a specific hashtag or you want them to do something specific, think about how you can make it easier for them and just invest a little bit of time preparing your digital marketing um, content for them. Okay, we're actually um, halfway through the things I'm going to share with you today. So we're just going to have a, a little break and uh, not a get up break. That's in, in a moment. So don't all dash. Um, we'll just, uh, just have a look at this little video for Dance Tag. It's, is anyone familiar with Dance Tag? What's happened with that? Okay, let's, I'll just share this with you. It's it's interesting thing that um, Pavilion Dance Southwest have done recently. <laughs> Do you want to go? Ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's easy. She did well, but I we can top that. Yeah, we can challenge her, definitely. Challenge accepted. Why don't we challenge each other? I think we should. So that was a project that was funded as part of the digital R&D 
project through Nesta and a lot of research went into that project to develop that app and the design of it was to get um, people dancing that might not otherwise or to ride on this wave of um, people sort of competing with each other and connecting. So it's out there and it's live now and if any of you or any of your students think you can do better than those moves, I'd really encourage you to actually download it, give it a go and see if you can make something happen. I'd really like to see the um, the graduate companies, you know, the companies with the at the dance venues actually doing some stuff on here, showing us some really exciting stuff. You'll get showcased on the homepage and get some engagement and activity happening. So I think we're fortunate that um, that project sort of invested time and money into that. The outcomes of that project and the findings are now all published on Pavilion Dance Southwest website. So if you want to um, learn something from what they learnt, you can go and read that all now. So we've talked about the seven Ps and a little bit of marketing uh, fundamentals. Let's talk now about why digital marketing is different to normal marketing. About uh, six or, or so years ago when um, things changed in the marketing and advertising space, what happened was we had some disruptive technology come along. So we had YouTube emerge, Wikipedia happened, all these things that came along which we used to refer to as Web 2.0 came along and changed the way we used the internet. So in the past, marketing and advertising used to be a real one-way communication. So you put an ad on the TV, you place a, an ad in a magazine, and the audience would be passive and read it. What happened with YouTube and um, the internet where the audience could suddenly start to communicate back was a dialogue started to happen. It, it became a two-way communication. So now marketing is about this dialogue and this discussion. So it's gone from a push strategy with you pushing out information you want people to know to a pull strategy where the audience decides what they want to know about what you're doing and they take that content and then they comment on it. So it's a real shift in the way things work. And um, it's really, really powerful. It means that we um, hear a lot about what our audiences think, where we might not have heard that before. That can be really good and it can be really challenging if you don't hear what you want to hear. It also means people, um, audiences are expecting to engage in this space. So if they have a problem, they'll jump on Twitter and let the whole world know about it and they expect you to respond to it in a time of fashion. So um, one of the other powerful things is, of course, you can reach people that you could never reach before in a really cost-effective way by travelling through these networks. When I first started in sales and marketing, we used to work to this sort of a system. It's called the sales funnel. So if you put an event on, and so does everybody else in London, uh, but uh, the your consumer or your potential audience member becomes aware that your event's on. They consider all the different options of what to do on that night. They make a decision and then they buy your ticket. And that was, we were really focused on pushing people through a funnel and then they'd buy and that, that was sort of it, the end of the relationship you'd achieved the marketing goal. That's um, old fashioned now, it doesn't quite work. Now, now we have what's called the customer decision journey. So just take a deep breath and shake your head for a bit and let's get around this notion. It's a really important thing to understand if you're going to spend time in digital marketing. So that funnel is still there to a degree. These green circles represent those aspects of the funnel. So people become aware of your event, they consider whether they're going to um, go to your event or someone else's, they make an evaluation, and then they actually buy. But that's only half of the journey. Now, there's this thing called the loyalty loop. So once someone's bought something from you, there's this experience of bonding 
with you or with your product or with your company or with your choreographer and this aspect of advocacy they can um, advocate on your behalf and tell thousands, potentially hundreds and thou of thousands of people about what you're doing and why they should then buy as well. So there's this really important aspect which digital marketing and social media marketing works really, really nicely with. Let's just have a look at a real world example of, um, of this sort of thinking about the loyalty loop area. Expressions Dance Company are a dance company in Australia, contemporary dance company. Anyone seen Expressions? No? Oh, if they come back over here, you should definitely go see them. Um, they, uh, their lead uh, marketing lead, Kirsten Bartholomew, is currently in the middle of this campaign. So this is for an event that's on uh, in July in Queensland's Performing Arts Complex and it's a performance of The Red Shoes reimagined um, re by their artistic director and choreographer Natalie Weir. So eight performances in a really big venue, lots of seats to fill. So um, Kirsten's goal is to actually build engagement at this stage of her marketing campaign. So she's using social media. She actually pays for Facebook ads to get the word out to people. And the reason she does that is because that gains her lots of likes. She can get extra likes that quickly that way. And once people like um, the, her page, she's able to then work on an engagement strategy with them. She's also running an Instagram competition, um, at E! News as well, and drip feeding content um, as we get closer to the launch date of the event of what's happening behind the scenes. So focusing on that notion of that rich content of videos and images and things. So results so far over the last three months, she's had an 11% increase in her Facebook likes and a 21% increase in her e-newsletter subscribers. So this allows her to actually build that um, potential audience uh, space and then to engage and um, interact with that audience in the lead up to the show and then for other shows later on. So just a reminder about this loyalty loop. Um, she's focusing on some bonding and trying to leverage some advocacy in this process. If we just uh, focus on this a little bit more uh, before we leave it, um, this loyalty loop is about consumer-led marketing. So it's about this making information available so people can pull what they want, the information they want, when they want it. So bonding, the bonding step actually happens most effectively when you deal with a problem. So when someone's unsatisfied with something and you actually resolve it for them and deal with it, then they change from a um, detractor to an advocate for what you're doing. So if you run into any hiccups with things, if something goes wrong after someone's bought a ticket or someone's not happy with you in the social media space, look at it as an opportunity, not as a threat. Because if you can resolve that effectively, then you will have bonded with that person and they'll become an advocate for you. Advocacy happens by exceeding expectations. So if you can think through those seven P's of marketing and make sure that when, once someone's bought a ticket, they come to an event, all those areas you've thought through and they have a really good experience when they're with you, not just the performance, which of course you will have focused and there would have been blood, sweat and tears over, but the actual process and the space of actually coming into an event and having that experience. Think that through. Um, if you create easily shareable content, people will actually advocate on your behalf through the social networks. And during events, so when you've actually got people at your event, I have one client whose um, results from their social media engagement go, go up between 1,400 and 1,800% whenever they have an event. So they've 
they've just realised they have this amazing opportunity when they're doing events to actually really get some growth in their audience reach. And then these things will lead to that person buying again. In the dance industry, it's a real issue of someone just coming one off and seeing an event and then never coming back to your venue or never coming back to your company. This, this sort of a process will encourage them to come back again and to advocate to others. So, and then that allows you to offer them uh, VIP programs or ticketing discounts or things like that to encourage them to come back. I'll talk about gamification a little bit later, which is a technique you can use to encourage um, loyalty and engagement. Um, does anyone here in the audience have an example of ex where someone's exceeded expectations after they've bought something or some engagement online that they'd like to share? Yeah. Uh, what, uh, example in a company or, or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that probably springs to mind is Punch Drunk Festival Man, yep. which uh, they uh, extended their run. Yes. So the fact that you knew they were extending the run and they kept you in the loop of that, that helped with your bonding. Yeah. Okay, um, just for those of you that didn't hear, this was Punch Drunk's Straw Man. The Drowned Man. The, pardon? The, 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 the Drowned Man. The Drowned Man. I actually went to that, so you'd think I would remember <laughs> the name. Yeah, sorry. I did go, I did go. Um, I got really lost. But, um, yeah... Uh, so, um, yes, so the fact that they extended their season, they shared with their current audience and then that has an effect on one of their audience members who feels an extra bonding with them and, you know, probably some excitement about the fact they've had to extend, you know, it's such an, a successful uh, season, they've had to extend, well, that's good, you know, it's sort of confirmation that what you're enjoying and what you're spending your money on is confirmed by other people. So, um, yeah, nice example there. I had a... Um, a bad example of um, this, uh, so the opposite of advocacy, uh, last year where I, um, a dance venue was, had done a promotion if you bought a ticket to something you could then um, get a discounted ticket to another event and I wanted to do that, I got quite excited about that. Went through the process and it didn't work so I contacted them on Twitter asking about it. They came back just sent me to the same link that had not worked for me originally. So I went back and let them know and then they never got back to me again. So there was sort of this initial customer service and then when it got difficult, um, they probably weren't resourced enough to actually deal with my question. But the end result was I didn't actually buy that second ticket. So it's really important that you do actually answer customer service questions in the media space. And if you find you don't have the resourcing to do it, and I can really empathise with that. I know a lot of digital marketers that are working extraordinary hours, way too many hours than they should. Um, the processes need to be looked at. Sometimes if you're sharing um, social media identity with a group of people in an organisation, things can get dropped and missed, so you need to make sure that everyone's in communication and you know who's doing what, when. Okay, time for another video. Okay, so that's a band called <laughs> OK Go. And um, that's another example of people taking your medium, dance, to get 20 million views to a video. So the power of dance in, incorporated into something can really get you an amazing reach. Um, OK Go are, are an interesting band. They do, they do incorporate dance into a lot of their videos and they do do a lot of their videos in one take. So they rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and then shoot the video in one take and that's also one of the reasons they go viral because people are so amazed at what they're able to do. Um, of course, uh, we saw the Harlem Shake phenomenon. Um, can I see a show of hands of who knows what the Harlem Shake is? 
just about everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, it, for those of you that don't, it was a, uh, a thing that went viral, a novel thing, a group of young men from the Sunshine Coast in Australia in the town, the small town I came from before I moved over here, they um, came up with this idea which they filmed, which was them just being a little bit silly and then uh, doing a bit of a dance with a, uh, something on their head to a, a song. And, and this absolutely took off and went round the world and everybody, uh, lots of people jumped on it for fun, for excitement and savvy marketers jumped on it as well. So the English National Ballet's version of this, um, actually I took this screenshot um, probably two years ago. Now it's closer to, it's 1.4 million views. So this has reached an audience that EMB never would have been able to reach otherwise. The, the thing to remember with this sort of stuff is um, you have an opportunity to ride on the quest on the crest of, of something that's captured the imagination of the public, it's important that you convert that into something else. So there's a link on there somewhere for people to go once they've seen your video and want to know more about your organisation. It's surprising the amount of people that did this but then didn't actually connect it to who they were. Um, you don't have to be the English National Ballet to do something like that. This is just a local dance studio who did their own version of the Harlem Shake and they've got 40,000 views just from that. <coughs> I won't show you that video. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Twitter. Um, has anyone tweeted about this event yet? Thank you. I'll be running a tweet reach report on you all, so that's good to see. Um, thank you. Please use the hashtag D-U-K business, if you would. And if you've got room, uh, copy in Dance UK and myself, Danceology HQ, particularly if you say something nice. And um, that would be good. So I'm, I'm not going to drill into, we don't have time tonight to sort of drill into all the different social media platforms and how to engage in those spaces. What I am going to do is take a little bit of time to have a look at some Twitter examples just because it highlights some key issues that can actually be rolled across the other networks. This is a heat map which looks at link success on Twitter. Um, I, I share it with you because it's very easy to put a link in your tweet at the end because it's a logical place to put it. You say a sentence and then you put a link for people to connect to, so you put it at the end. What the statistics show us, and this is based on studying 200,000 tweets, is that the great spot to put your link is here in the top third. So if you can rearrange your um, structure of your tweet to put your link there, it's more likely that it will be clicked on. A couple more um, statistics uh, on how to encourage retweets. Um, Taras Young from the Arts Marketing Association has written a terrific guide on how to use Twitter for cultural and arts organisations. So if you need a little bit of help with how you're engaging in the Twitter space, I recommend you go and download that. Um, in there, he points out some statistics. Um, if you put an image in your tweet, you're going to get twice as much engagement. So let's see some of those great dance images on the tweets. Um, including a hashtag will increase uh, your retweets by 21%. Including a link increases it by 86%, which is a pretty phenomenal um, figure. And I've put this one in. Um, Taras would be horrified that I've shown you this because uh, he would say that you're an art, your dancers, your interesting creative people, you would have something much more exciting to say to get people to retweet than say, please retweet. <laughs> he, he has a point and yes, but occasionally pull this out of your toolkit and use it because it gets 51% more retweets. <laughs> Uh, this is just an example of um, Kenneth Tharp's um, biog from 
uh, Twitter. I, I just bring it up because um, if you haven't updated your Twitter biography recently or your profile, please go and do it because things have changed in that space and you want your information to be current. I like how he addresses this. He says who he is, uh, what the point is, uh, the place London where dance is going next. He shares some personal information, which is really important on Twitter. People like that space as a bit of a personal space. And then lists his very impressive <laughs> things that he has here. So um, a nice example, I think, of a Twitter biography. I just want to bring up some potential risks in the area of Twitter. So if you, can you all read this from the back of the room? Yep. So in America, getting slizzard means getting drunk. So this was actually posted by the head of social media for American Red Cross. And they were out on a, you know, an intervention doing what they do. And she, they had some beer and she tweeted this. Within an hour, it went viral and there were a lot of very, very upset donators. So a bit of a disaster started to happen. I like the way the Red Cross responded with this one here. We've deleted the rogue tweet, but rest assured the rest <laughs> Red Cross is sober and we've confiscated the keys. Really, really clever. They've downplayed the issue and they've made light of it. Um, so they've made it a little bit humorous. So I think a, a really clever way to respond. In this, on the social media space, you can't ignore these things. If something goes wrong, you can't put your head in the sand and pretend it hasn't happened. You need to address it because if you're not talking about it, everybody else is and you're not going to be involved in the conversation. So a response like this, we can really learn from. A point, um, the professional that did it said it was because of a mix-up with her misunderstanding of using Hootsuite. So if you're using a platform or a technology to help you do your tweets, um, make sure you do know what you're doing and you don't drink a little bit and forget because it can go wrong. Um, this was a nice development as well. The, the company that um, Dogfish Beer that they were drinking jumped on it and said, OK, we'll donate. You know, everyone, that, let's, let's donate some money and let's get involved. So they were very clever. They rode on the wave of that publicity that they got and turned it into something really positive for themselves. Um, just a point about hashtag fail. Can you read that? I'm not going to tell you what's happened with that, but um, that went a little bit wrong. And I've seen that happen a few times in that I, I follow a, um, a, website, <laughs> a website called, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'll just give you a moment there. I follow a website called Experts Exchange for information on internet related matters and theirs turns out as Expert Sex Change <laughs> and the other day I came this close to launching a um, page on a website for a local council which when I got someone to check the site for me they pointed out they thought it read Outdoor Orgy App. So you've got to be really careful when you're putting these words. It was outdoor gym map, so it was something, you know, <laughs> innocuous, but it just turned out badly. So if you um, put your words together, who knows the name of when you put words together? I did know it. I've forgotten it. Mm. Um, when you merge your words, words for a hashtag or even for a, a, web, a URL on your website, if you create a new page, if you're in charge of your site, get someone else to check it or just be really careful that it doesn't turn into something embarrassing for you. I find um, that there's a local team here from Twitter in the UK and they have this um, Twitter handle, Twitter UKI underscore SME. They provide lots of useful information and lots of free webinars. So if you want to get across Twitter a little bit more, follow them and they'll be helpful for you. Uh, last point um, really about etiquette and about how to engage in the digital space. 
this quote here, I think I work in a nursery and I don't mean working with plants, was a rather innocuous comment that was put on a Facebook, uh, Facebook post by a woman who worked for a company, had a rough day, came home, had a glass of wine and did a little bit of a vent. What then happened is um, a discussion happened on her Facebook page about this. It didn't get much worse than that. It was nothing to write home about. But as you can see from this reference here, it ended up in a court case because this lady was dismissed the next morning. The reason she was dismissed is because one of her friends took a screenshot of the conversation and sent it to her manager. And when she went into work the next day, the manager dismissed her based on what was inside their social media policy. So I bring this up with you because if you are working in, in the space that you're working in, be, be careful what you say, be prudent in what you say because it's not just on your business and on your organisation's pages, it's on your personal pages where you need to be appropriate in relation to your, the work that you do. And if you're employing <coughs> people, you need to make sure they're aware of your expectations in the social space and what's appropriate. Earlier on this year, I wrote the digital um, engagement strategy for Dance Up and the social media guidelines were an important part of that document because that just helped them and their volunteers understand how to engage in that space. So it's about communication, really. Let's uh, have a look at a real world example of how Twitter's been used effectively. This is Why Dancers campaign to do with their Commonwealth Youth Dance Festival. And um, they really focused on harnessing the power of their networks to reach a larger audience. So what they did was they decided that they wanted to hit um, social media with a really big influx of communications about their festival on the day where it was 50 days until the event. So they asked people to do a version of this image with the um, why in some creative way. So that was the um, concept behind it. Something I found really interesting about this campaign was that although it's a digital campaign, they used um, some non-digital techniques to make it happen. So they wanted it to be a secret. So they got on the phone to Dance UK and to various um, other people that were attending and or got onto email and let them know what they were asking them to do and to participate in it so that um, it would all come together behind the scenes without any visibility on digital media until that day when it actually happened. So this is just a screenshot of the Facebook album with some of the photos that are here. Let me see if the Dance UK one is here. Oh, it's not there. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, um, that's what caught my attention actually was the Dance UK image, which was really fun and um, g brought my attention to the festival and what was going on there. So um, they got images from all around the world, a real, a real lot of enthusiasm and response to this. And they were able to reach 70,000 accounts in seven hours, which was a really big achievement for their uh, small organisation. Um, lessons that were learnt from that, they said it didn't matter that not everyone used the tagline. When they first created this um, campaign, they were really adamant they wanted everyone to say 50 days until CYDF14, which was the hashtag. Um, not everybody did because people never actually follow your rules on social media because it's not about rules, it's about doing what people want. So um, they found it didn't matter. So on reflection, they probably wouldn't bother with a tagline. They wished instead they'd ask people to copy in the Why Dance um, Twitter handle because that would have made it much easier for them to track results because they don't have many resources to track results. Okay, uh, we're moving on to section five. I'm a big fan of Twyla Tharp and she wrote a fantastic book called The Creative Habit. If you're a choreographer and you haven't read it, I really suggest that you do read it. She says, every day I begin my life with a 
ritual. And um, the interesting thing is uh, she does two hours at the gym every morning and Twyla's in her 60s now and she still does that two hours every day. Um, but her ritual is not the two hours at the gym. Her ritual is getting up, getting in the elevator at her apartment, going down to the ground floor and getting in a taxi. That's her daily ritual because once she's done that, she ends up at the gym and she does two hours. And the reason I bring that up with you is it's another method or a way of thinking about doing things you're having trouble doing or you don't want to do or you know you should do. So when it comes to your digital marketing, if you can think of a way to create a ritual that makes you do it, then that will help you be disciplined and continue with it long term. Um, Hootsuite, TweetDeck, just some tools to help you manage your tweets. I've been using Hootsuite for a while now and it's been really helpful, particularly when I've been on holidays um, and all staff are sharing um, uh, digital campaigns. Another um, useful thing is to have what's sometimes called a content calendar or a publishing calendar. So I have um, my year um, planned out and I know when I'm going to do particular things and I can map that against um, different audience segments and different global events that are going on. Twitter supplies this which is called the Own the Moment Planner and you can go just um, Google Own the Moment or have a look on search on Twitter for it. That Twitter ID I gave you earlier um, is the one that brought my attention to this and they will show you all these big global events that are happening. So it gives you an opportunity to ride on the quest, uh, crest of um, events that are happening worldwide. Of course, um, speaking of riding on the crest of events that are happening, Big Dance is happening uh, soon. Sadler's Wells is one of the hubs for there. Who's doing a Big Dance, uh, getting involved in Big Dance? Yeah, great, uh, great event, great thing to uh, promote dance to the wider community. And if you're doing an event or in involved in the discussion, you have the potential to reach wider audiences that you wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise via digital marketing. Um, also, next month, um, there's, uh, we're starting up Dance Talk London, which is just an um, informal meetup of people getting together who work in marketing and dance to have a discussion about what they're doing, what's working for them and what their pain points are. Um, just a relaxed catch up, I'll be there. Um, I'd like to see as many of you there as you can. Please go and join the group and once there's a critical mass there, we'll sort out a date and a location. So finally, iterate. Um, measurement. If you can't measure what you're doing, really think about whether you're going to do it or not because you can't learn from it and improve if you're not measuring. Uh, a recent uh, um, development in the measurement area is a thing called sum all. Is anyone using sum all? Aha, yes. Quite amazing because you can pop in all your digital identity. So I've got, here's this MailChimp, Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus. You can even put your own um, web analytics in there and it will give you a map that shows all of those things going on at once rather than having to go to all the separate measurements. So really useful time saving thing and it will send you a weekly report as well on what's going on. Just a reminder that um, if you've got a website, make sure you are tracking the statistics. It's easy to get yourself sent a weekly or a monthly report from Google Analytics to actually see what's going on on your website. And of course, TweetReach is an easy, free way to have a look at what's happening in your Twitter uh, results. Um, finally, in relation to <coughs> Uh, measurement. This is a technique that some of my clients use really effectively. When we survey our customers, we can always often get really detailed and complex and give them all these big questions we're trying to assess. This is called the Net Promoter Score. It's really simple. You ask your audiences one question. How likely is it that you would recommend X 
to your friend or colleague and they score it from 0 to 10. Mm. And you want as many people saying 9 and 10 as you can get because they're the people that will advocate on your behalf, they're the people that will come back to your shows, they're the people you want. So you do this one year, do it again in six months' time, do it again in 18 months' time and see how you're moving people from the detractor space to the promoter space and then you'll know you're doing good things. Let's just have a look at this. Just a reminder to be mobile. So a bit of a downer at the end of my talk. Sorry about that. I should have put the OK Go one on last. But um, I show you that um, because that's an example of um, location um, aware mobile technologies. So mobile devices becoming more and more important as a way that we're engaging with our audiences and things are changing in that space. Um, FireChat, I won't take the time to spend, talk about now. It'll be in my links. It's an emerging platform. <coughs> things like Apple's iBeacon and other near, and near field communication technologies are providing opportunities for dancers in the performance space. Things are being explored in relation to performance there, but it also provides um, you an opportunity to sell tickets to people that are walking past your venue on a particular day. So there's lots of opportunities there to connect with people via mobiles. I want to bring up the concept of gamification with you because it's an area I've been working in for the last couple of years and I think there's real potential for the dance industry to get involved with this. Um, I'm halfway through a four-year project that was initiated by the NHS and is now rolled out through some local councils where we're getting people to exercise more um, by using techniques that are used in the gaming industry but on an online platform to get them to do some exercises and then um, log it. And uh, we use things like leaderboards and badges and rewards. I think that if um, someone's coming to your event and they see every performance um, during a season for, from different companies or they see three, three shows in a year or something, you've got real potential to be rewarding those people but in a unified system that they understand using gamification techniques so on their online profile they can track what rewards they've got and what badges they've received. So it's an area I'm really passionate about, so we don't have time to talk about it now, but if anyone would like to talk to me about gamification later, please grab me in the break. Crowdfunding, who's familiar with crowdfunding? Most of you, okay. Um, there's, this is a screenshot of the dance things that are happening in the crowdfunding space on Kickstarter and there's a specific dance funder now. I can't recommend them, I haven't used them, but it's, that area is growing as a way to actually fund things that you might be doing. I know some companies that have done a Kickstarter um, project, not because they need the money, because they want to actually tell more people about what they're doing. If you do a Kickstarter project, it, um, it's a method for actually promoting what you're doing. And finally, um, wearable technology. So from Google Glass through to the iWatch through to things like this. This is a concept garment called the Move and it has panels in it which connect with an application which senses how the dancer is moving and it can provide haptic feedback to the dancer about their posture. I bring this up um, from a marketing perspective, interesting to tweet about, um, I think from a dance education and learning perspective, it's going to be really exciting to see what might happen with dance wear and how that might influence some um, training in the future. I just had to share that with you. Okay, so we're going to end here. What I'd like to ask you to do is hopefully you've gained some insight that you can take away and actually use in your own area. If you're not already a Dance UK member, please, please join because they do a very important role in advocacy and make things like today possible. Um, these slides will be available and a film, uh, edited film of today will be available on the Dance UK TV website. 
join a, the Arts Marketing Association or somewhere like that if you feel like you need extra assistance with your marketing techniques. And please uh, come along and join Dance Talk London when we have our next event. Uh, remember, be playful, be useful, be mobile, and remember that there's shortcuts to happiness and dancing is one of them. Thank you.